Since the dawn of the 21st century, scientific discovery has rushed forward at lightning speed. Genetics, physics, computerized technology, robotics, virtual reality. Join Derek and Sharon Gilbert as they uncover the truths behind this ultimate scientific deception. Welcome to Sci Friday. Ancient history, some of the mysteries we explore with. Science! Welcome to Sci Friday. I'm Derek Gilbert. I am Sharon Gilbert. Welcome to our family room and welcome to our home. We are so glad that you've chosen to spend a little time with us. We are excited about uh, the work of archaeologists, as you saw last week, but uh, not all archaeology, in fact, most archaeology out there is digging into what they think, what scientists believe, researchers believe, the secular world. Most mm -hmm. researchers in the field don't have a biblical worldview. That's fine. We appreciate their work anyway. We will not challenge the data. We just uh, may differ on our interpretation of it, and that's why we do this program. Science is not incompatible with the Bible. Not at all. We just need all. to apply the Bible to our understanding of the data. Well, amen to that. Uh, we have part two of an interview we did, a second interview we mm -hmm. did with Scott Stripling last year. Right. Uh, we were at the International Symposium on Archaeology and the Bible, and in fact, this year's is coming up in just a couple of weeks in uh, Albuquerque. Uh, you may still have time to uh, find out more about that. Uh, Trinity Southwest University and Veritas International University are putting this on. Uh, Dr. Stephen Collins, who's the lead archaeologist at the site of Tall El Hammam. You remember we did the interviews with uh, his director of scientific analysis, Dr. Philip Sylvia, several weeks ago. Uh, Dr. Stephen Collins is really the one who's coordinated this and put this together. And, uh, you know, this is one of the things I guess we can thank COVID for, because if it hadn't been for COVID, they would have been in Jordan digging at those places and would not have brought back this symposium last year, which mm -hmm. had been on hiatus because they were out digging in the sands of Jordan. Um, but uh, thankfully, last year was such a success. They're having it back again this year. And while we were there last year, we had the opportunity to sit down with Dr. Scott Stripling for a couple of interviews. And uh, we'll bring you the uh, our discussion of um, the location of Solomon's Temple and the Second Temple, uh, as expanded by Herod, uh, after the break, because oh. that is uh, causing some controversy right now in oh, uh, Christian dear. circles. He's making waves. Well, uh, he's defending the traditional understanding, the traditional um, belief that the temple is where the rabbis think it is, mm -hmm. right there on the Temple Mount. Well, good for and he, him. And he explains why. There's a lot of uh, contention on that area right now, and there are a lot of there's a lot of friction going on between the Waqf and the Israeli police. Mm -hmm. Is that how you pronounce it? W A Q F. Waqf. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. There's been a lot. In fact, I think they arrested one man that's uh, part of the Waqf. Well, there's a uh, a lot of um, tension over that area, and I would suggest that it is evidence that there's something supernatural, there's something spiritual about that location. I totally agree with you. Now, if you are not familiar with that term, waqf, W-A-Q-F, mm -hmm. they are actually Jordanian. It's the Jordanian authority that has had uh, official, um, th they are legally, technically, uh, the, the conservators of what is on the Temple Mount. Right. In 1967, after the Israelis recaptured Jerusalem from the, um, uh, the Jordanian army. Um, they could have established Israeli control over the Temple Mount. Uh, in fact, I've written about this a bit um, in, in one of the uh, anthologies published by Defender Publishing. I wrote about the, uh, the third temple and will there be a third temple on the Temple Mount and what all is involved there. Um, Moshe Dayan, who was the, uh, yeah. the commander, the uh, military commander at the time, and for many Israelis at that time, um, many of whom were secular because they had come out of socialist countries like yes. the former Soviet Union and did not have a religious worldview. For them, the Temple Mount was nothing more than a historical curiosity. Um, you know, there was historical interest to it, and they thought that perhaps if they allowed the, the government of Jordan, the, the Hashemite kingdom, to control the Temple Mount, uh, that they could perhaps buy some peace with, with Muslims. And obviously that has not proven to be the case. And it has only gotten worse as a, a greater percentage of the Israeli population um, is, uh, is religious. And this was by design as they, they exempted um, 
certain segments of the population from religious or from military service, rather, those who are uh, the, the Haradim. And uh, so they are really pushing more of a religious world. When you say Haradim, you the mean? The ultra-Orthodox. Yes. Um, and they consider that, I say Haradim because actually they could consider ultra-Orthodox to be kind of an insult. Mm. So, and, and we don't want to insult anybody here. No, not here. at all. And again, trying to understand the Hashemite kingdom, that's relatively new. That's post-World War Two, I think. Well, uh, World War One. Yes, post-World War I. Uh, and uh, there, there is friction and tension not only between Jews and Muslims over the control of the Temple Mount, but between various factions in the Arabic world. Yes. In fact, the, the Dome of the Rock, which is the, the mosque that sits above the uh, foundation stone, which is believed to be the stone uh, that was the foundation, the cornerstone for the temple, believed to be the stone where Abraham bound Isaac, uh, perhaps the stone where David offered his sacrifice, you know, bought the threshing floor of Arana. It's so also it's, thought that there is a cavity underneath of it right, called the Well of Souls. The well of Souls, correct. And uh, I write about that in my book, The Second Coming of Saturn, because of the practice going back to ancient times among the Hurrians, the Horites in the Bible, of summoning spirits from the netherworld. It just, that was relevant because Arana, from whom David bought the Temple Mount, was a Hurrian. And we talk about that in Giants, Gods, and Dragons. Right. So there's um, a a long history on that mountain. Or is it in veneration? Maybe it's in veneration. I think in veneration. But the the threshing floor, yes, yes, in in veneration. Um, But the reason the uh, dome on the Dome of the Rock is is gilded is because uh, the the, the late king, the the previous king of Jordan, uh, King... um, Hussein. King Hussein, thank you was uh, concerned because the Saudi had offered to uh, gild the dome, and he was afraid that that would give them more influence over the Temple Mount, oh. and he wanted to maintain that because that is a measure of prestige and uh, respect in the well, uh, You know, those Muslim of us world. who are even my age, we just assume it's always been gilded, but it was lead. There's a lead dome underneath Right. There. Now, it was originally gilded back in the 7th century when it was built, but over the years, the uh, gold leaf worn vanished? away or perhaps it vanished. We don't know. But anyway, it disappeared over time and left it just a gray dome. So it wasn't until uh, relatively recently that uh, King Hussein had it gilded again. This was in 1992. In the 60s. Oh, 90s. That's right. Yeah. It was very recent. So The other thing that I found interesting, now correct me if I'm wrong about the Hashemite kingdom, is that that family was given the kingdom because they claimed to be direct descendants of uh, Muhammad. That is correct. So there's, uh, again, a a lot of political and religious infighting among Muslims, as well as between Muslims and Jews and Jews and Christians and, you know, and various factions of Mm -hmm. Christians, because you've got uh, the Roman Catholic Church and you've also got the Greek Orthodox and you've got the, you know, just various groups that want control Mm -hmm. over Jerusalem as a whole and over the Temple Mount in particular. And And in the Bible, in the Old Testament, this region that we call Jordan, the, the, the lines on our maps weren't there back in the day, and it was Ammon and Moab, Correct. or Moab, you may may see. Yes, and then Edom further south, yes. which or the region around Petra. So the uh, Transjordanian kingdoms, which are mentioned apparently in end times prophecy, Psalm 82 or Psalm 83, if that is in fact a, a future fulfillment, uh, seems to suggest that there will be some uh, conflict there involving those nations. But... Uh, that they may escape without being destroyed in that conflict. So there, there is a, a lot of uh, political, religious conflict over that 35-acre pe- piece of ground. Mm-hmm. And I would suggest that it's because the spirit realm knows that there is something really significant now, about that. imagine Washington, D.C. having the Washington Monument and perhaps the Jefferson Memorial, certain areas that we don't consider them sacred. There are some who may, but I don't personally. I think that they're interesting to visit. Uh, But they have sacred geometry, and that's a long story that we can't get into. But imagine if another country, say Canada or Mexico, controlled it. It would be um, problematic. Yeah, it would be problematic. Yeah. It was a bad solution, and it has not um, made things any easier. Uh, the Israelis probably 
wouldn't have had an easier time of things if they had just assumed control of it back in 1967. But if there was ever a time for them to do it, it would have been then. Mm -hmm. Um, It wasn't meant to be. Well, no, it wasn't meant to be. And as Christians, we understand that we don't need a third temple. God does not promise a third temple, but there is a belief that because in the book of Daniel, the uh, Antichrist figure puts an end to the... um, the sacrifices that there, we, we assume that there must be a third temple, and it's assumed that it must be on that place, on the Temple Mount. And there are various theories as to mm-hmm. how that might be accomplished without building a temple uh, on the loc- on that location, which would be really problematic because it would mean moving the Dome of the Rock out of the way, one way or another. Mm-hmm. Now, that's a very active seismic region, and it's possible that it might. In fact, the last attempt to build the temple uh, in the fourth century, I think was put to a stop by a massive earthquake. The the Jews were trying to rebuild the temple on the Temple Mount. Again, the Lord was saying, this is not my timing. Yeah. Not my timing. Well, speaking of timing, we need to take a break. Yes, and uh, when we come back, uh, a little more on that, we got some people to thank. We'll tell you about our special in the month of August and our interview with Dr. Scott Stripling on the site of the temple historically based on archaeology when Sci Friday continues. Space is not the final frontier, but there are those who want you to think it is. 75 years ago, something crashed in the desert near Roswell, New Mexico. An industry has grown up to sell the idea that the pilots were extraterrestrials. We want you to know the truth. For a limited time, we're making available a special offer featuring the groundbreaking book, The Day the Earth Stands Still. This book shows step-by-step how the occult teachings of Madame Blavatsky and Aleister Crowley grew into the ancient aliens hypothesis of the modern UFO movement. It's our Gilbert House Roswell special. For just $35, we'll send you The Day the Earth Stands Still, plus our DVD sets, The Best of Sci Friday, Volumes 1 and 2. It's a $65 value for just $35. Take advantage of the Gilbert House Roswell Special for a limited time only, and you'll only find it at our store, online at gilberthouse.org. Welcome back to Sci Friday. I'm Derek Gilbert. I am Sharon Gilbert. I want to remind you, if you want to see the Temple Mount, uh, right now it's on the list of places we plan to go in March oh, of 2023. 20, yeah. uh, I was surprised back in 2019 that we got up on the Temple Mount because it was during Ramadan. I know. And in fact, there were some boys, that, little boys who called us Satan and threw pebbles <laughs> at us. And the police reacted to it. They, they did not yeah. like that. Yeah, yeah. So we can legitimately say they tried to stone us on the Temple Mount, but uh, no, no one was hurt. There was no danger. Not at all. Um, it's one of the safest places to be on Earth. Trust me when we say that, because yes. there are soldiers and police everywhere. We saw so many young families pushing children around. We saw, in fact, when we were in the city of David, we saw a, a group of children, maybe five or six years old, a group of about six of them, who were walking together with no adult supervision as they went to school and back, and our guide stopped and talked to them for a moment, and he said, yeah, yeah, they're on their way back home from school. And we wouldn't do that in, in suburban St. Louis Not with our daughter. Not at all. Here we are, and then we're in a little area, an Arabic area, right. enjoying some ice cream and yep. watching all these kids play. And Yeah, it was. it's incredible. It's not what the media tried to tell you is going on over there. Uh, so, before yes. I forget, you said we were going to thank some people. I want to thank my friend Charlotte Martin who made this beautiful little painting that she did of the sunflowers and our fence in our yard. She's watched the pictures that I post on Facebook. Charlotte is the mom of one of my dearest, dearest friends in this whole wide world, Cindy Martin. And so I love, love Charlotte. She is just a lady that I look forward to spending many, many days with in heaven because Mm -hmm. she is a heavenly lady. I also want to remind you that our uh, Roswell special, the July special, is ending in a couple of days, mm-hmm. and uh, we've got a brand new one for August. Yeah, it's uh, uh, interesting. We're living in strange times. I mean, who'd have thought? Who'd have thought three years ago we'd live in a time where declining an experimental experimental medical procedure would get you, you know, bar you from travel and perhaps even get you locked up? Yeah. Yeah. Well, actually, we did. Um, 
I actually borrowed. That was 2002, 2003? Yeah, but uh, updated and republished in 2021 uh, when it suddenly became a lot more relevant than we'd uh, thought back yeah. in the day. But concepts from this borrowed from Sharon's novel, The Armageddon Strain, which we will be republishing soon. Mm -hmm. um, so, yes, it deals with some concepts that uh, suddenly became very top of mind uh, recently. The God Conspiracy. But, yes, this is fiction based, we hope, on sound theology. We do the best that we can there, and uh, we've got 12 hours of video teachings to go along with this. These two DVDs, each of these packages, by the way, two DVDs in each, so it's four DVDs, 12 hours of teaching to go along with the novel. These two DVDs retail would cost you $50 each, $100. That's yep. the price that's on the back. $20 for the book, $120. Yep, just $35 shipping and handling, plus shipping and handling. Did and um, price this? <laughs> you must have. <laughs> but you can get it at the gilberthouse.org store. Just go to gilberthouse.org, shop with us. Mm -hmm. our You'll little find store. a link there. And uh, this uh, will be the special all through the month of August. You could put a QR code on the screen. I, I could. Yeah, well, I, she says, because she doesn't have to do it. <laughs> or just go to our website, gilberthuss.org, and shop is the link. It's in the menu bar. Yes, and uh, again, that'll be the uh, August special at the store. Crazy. Well, um, archaeology and the Bible uh, is such an, an exciting uh, topic. And, I and could that's talk why about we were, this for years. Well, and I'm glad, because this is what we, uh, this is what we do. I know, I know. Um, when we were at the International Symposium on Archaeology and the Bible last year, uh, September, mm -hmm. last September, we had the opportunity to sit down with Dr. Scott Stripling, who uh, played a key role in, uh, along with our friend Aaron Lipkin, in uh, identifying and deciphering the, uh, the lead curse tablet from the site of Joshua's altar. But he's also been leading a dig at the site of ancient Shiloh. Um, but he's also taken it upon himself to uh, defend the, uh, the location uh, the traditional mm -hmm. understanding of the location of the temple. And uh, we asked him why, why this topic is now, why, that, that identification, that location is now being called into question. I'm Derek Gilbert at the International Symposium on Archaeology and the Bible with the Director of Excavations for the Associates for Biblical Research at Shiloh, Dr. Scott Stripling. Scott, welcome. Uh, we had uh, mentioned in our previous program the location of the water source at Shiloh, about a kilometer away, and of course we know the, uh, the tabernacle was there for more than three centuries. Without the water course there, why is that relevant to a debate that's sprung up recently about the location of Solomon's Temple? We have a lot of evangelicals who have, in the last decade or two, begun to theorize that the temple was actually in the city of David, right. not on the Temple Mount. And um, there's not a single archaeologist who believes this. And archaeology is a contact sport. We disagree on a lot of things, but we all agree that the temple was on the Temple Mount. And so this has begun to get traction, so I've started to address it with what we know archaeologically. Um, part of the argument of our friends who, who believe this, and it's an eschatological motivation, they're looking for a way to rebuild a temple and, you know, the, the, sure. it's part of God's master plan. In my view, God doesn't need our help. I mean, you know, it's, <laughs> the, the evidence is, is what it is, but their belief is that you could not have had the temple on what we call the Temple Mount because there was no spring on the Temple Mount right. and you had to have a spring. And they use like the letter of Aristeus and a mention in Tacitus and one of the pilgrim diaries to kind of build this case. But of course, we know archeologically that there was no spring on the Temple Mount. And so we explore this and part of the rationale of talking about Shiloh is that if the sacrificial system operated at Shiloh without a spring for 300 years, it certainly could have done it in Jerusalem. Of course, Herod, well, first the Maccabees in about 80 BC brought in the lower aqueduct. It runs all the way to the, to the Temple Mount. You can see it today. Mm -hmm. And then Herod brought in another aqueduct from Bethlehem in about 20 BC. So there was massive water. One cistern on the Temple Mount, Derek, holds 10 million gallons of water. One cistern. Hmm. And so the, the amount of water that is stored underneath the, in the bowels of the Temple Mount is phenomenal. So you didn't need the running water on the Mount itself, right there at the Temple site. They just brought the water up from the cistern? That's correct. Yeah, okay. Um, 
What, what other evidence is there regarding the location? I mean, did, did Josephus write anything about that? Oh, absolutely. And there's a lot. But um, let's say that this is the southwest corner of the Temple Mount here, the trumpeting stone that is found at the southwest corner, Josephus mentions that the trumpeter signals the beginning and end of Shabbat from the southwest corner of the Temple Mount. Where's the stone found? Mm -hmm. Right here. These guys are trying to convince us that the Temple Mount was actually the Antonia Fortress. Now, the rest of us believe that the Antonia Fortress was on the northwest corner of the Temple Mount. And so they're saying this actually was the Antonia Fortress and the temple itself is down here. We have a new wall, it's been all over the news recently, just excavated in the city of David, that is right next to the Gihon Spring, and that's where they claim that the temple was, our revisionist friends. Well, the two buildings can't occupy, occupy the same spot, and on top of that, to complicate it, there is a garbage dump that is 10 meters deep, that's 30 feet, by a football field long of garbage hmm. from the Second Temple period that is accumulated. It's all been excavated. You can't have the temple there when garbage is accumulating <laughs> yeah. over hundreds of years. Okay, it's not yeah. possible. Yeah. And so there's just many objections to, to, to this idea. Do, have the Jews ever questioned, uh, Jewish religious no. scholars ever questioned the location of the temple? No, never. Hmm. So this uh, essentially is a non-starter as far as archeologists are concerned. There's not a single archeologist who, who gives this any, any credence. And, and listen, I, these are sincere people and I'm not trying to, sure. to be dismissive or anything. I'm just, I, I wish that they would work through it. We happen to have some Christian archeologists who've devoted their life to this. Don't leave us out of the conversation, you know, but there are millions of people watching YouTube videos and you know, that are becoming convinced of this idea. So let's just let your audience know once and for all, the temple was on the temple mount. It's, uh all to do with end times prophecy. I know. As we mentioned in, before the break, if you have to push the, uh, somehow get rid of the Dome of the Rock in order to build a third temple, you've got all kinds of complications. And there are some who think that uh, if, if this was actually located in the city of David, that the temple could be built there, prophecy be fulfilled and not cause, well, World War III. You know, it's going to be done in the Lord's timing and it may not be, it may never happen. It may be started. In fact, you and I have said that the sacrifices could, we think, begin if they had a tabernacle. That's where they were originally done. Mm -hmm. Not in a stone temple, but in a tabernacle. And if they could erect the tabernacle, then they could do it. Yeah, and uh, that's uh, an interesting concept, too. We've had the opportunity to uh, meet and talk with uh, Jim Barfield, fairly, uh, several times now. Yes. In fact, when we were at uh, Qumran back in 2019, Jim Barfield, who heads up the Copper Scroll Project, met with us there and uh, shared some of his research into the Copper Scroll and his belief that the tabernacle, which is the big tent structure that was mm -hmm. used for, uh, by the Israelites to worship God for more than 300 years, um, that may still exist and it may be in a cave uh, at uh, Qumran. Now, it doesn't mean that they would reuse the actual, if they did find it, but it could give them, if they have any doubt as to how something was constructed or how, you know, a pr certain decoration was done or a certain, uh, I don't know if they've got any of the, uh, the, the decorative elements, but I think it could be redone. Mm -hmm. In fact, the, the Temple Institute probably has it all somewhere ready to go. They've got uh, much of the uh, utensils and, and items needed, the fixtures needed for temple service have already been recreated, including the... Uh, the, menorah. the menorah. And you yeah. need to put a photograph of the menorah because it's huge and it's gold. We assumed when we saw it in the old city, in the Jewish quarter of the mm -hmm. old city, that it, this was, you know, okay, this is just a model. This is what it's going to look like when they actually get it done. And no, lo and behold, this is actually the gold menorah that's been built. Donations from a, a uh, I believe, a Ukrainian Jewish businessman <laughs> who donated the money to create this thing. It is sitting in a glass case right out there in the open. It's like, I know, uh, and yet nobody steals it. It's, yeah. It's just sitting right there so, waiting to be used. Is the temple necessary? Well, that's a question for scholars who've done more research on this than, than we have. But if the tabernacle 
could be done. And, and as Scott pointed out during his uh, discussion, there are certain assumptions that have been made about the need for uh, some certain things. Like, for example, the, the uh, temple couldn't have been on the Temple Mount because there's no running water up there. Mm. But there's no running water. There's no spring at Shiloh either. No. And, the, and the sacrificial system operated for almost 400 years exactly. there. Exactly. They managed so to do that. It's possible, perhaps. In fact, Jim Barfield suggested this. If, as he discovered, Qumran is laid out as a an copy, inverse. an inverse copy of Jerusalem, is it possible they could set that up, set things up there? I, I don't know. I don't know. Um, God made pretty clear that Zion is where his name will dwell forever, and that mm -hmm. is the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. So that, again, is why we think there's so much fighting over control, for control of that 35-acre piece of ground. There's a spiritual struggle that is taking place for control there. Yes. But it is interesting that uh, archaeology at Shiloh, at Qumran, and of course in Jerusalem itself are contributing to our knowledge of what took place then and uh, may help us untangle some of the end-time prophecies. Unravel revel revelation? <laughs> yes. It's easy for you to say. <laughs> Well, you know, we also want to use, you mentioned earlier, we're going to thank some people. I thank Charlotte. But we also want to thank many of you because we have been overwhelmed with your generosity. Uh, Derek and I are still part of Skywatch TV, but Tom has encouraged us. And they said, please go with my blessing and expand your ministry while you remain here. Um, he is not a believer in captive uh, employees. He wants you to expand your own ministry because he believes that is the best way Grow. to get the gospel out there. So he's encouraged us to expand Gilbert House. And so we continue to do our Bible study on Sunday and we do Unraveling Revelation. And this program, you do VFTB. We've mm -hmm. got the best of, of, uh, of PID Radio, which was our first endeavor into mm -hmm. doing this kind of thing. So you can, again, go to gilberthouse.org and you can download our free app and enjoy all of our content for absolute free. But many of you have helped to make that possible by supporting us. And I cannot tell you how it, it just truly is overwhelming. It is humbling and it um, encourages us to want to do the best that we can each week as we produce these programs to make sure that we're uh, bringing you as much information as we can to the best of our ability. Um, the Bible study each Sunday morning is sort of the, uh, the foundation for all of it. So if you've not uh, yet taken advantage of our weekly Bible study, please join us for that. You can access it through the mobile app or Roku or Apple TV. Uh, you'll find the link for those apps, for those downloads at the website, Gilbert House. Dot org. We've also got a link at SciFriday.tv. You could access it there as well. Same app, absolutely free. And um, just to plug into the content, start with the Bible study because that's really what that's this is what all about. That's what started us. Absolutely. And um, everything else that we do is to just better understand what we're reading and studying in the Word of God because ultimately that is the only truth that is absolutely incorruptible, unchangeable, and trustworthy. Amen. And uh, we thank you for watching. This is Sci Friday. Sci Friday is a viewer supported outreach of Gilbert House Ministries. Follow us online at SciFriday.tv and GilbertHouse.org. That's where you'll find our weekly Bible study, the Gilbert House Fellowship. Join us each week as we go through the Bible verse by verse in chronological order. We'd love to hear from you. Contact us through our websites or drop us a line at P.O. Box 78. Crane, Missouri, 65633.